Good evening. Thank you so much for having us. Um, we are very proud to, to have Peter Louis Meiber here with us, um, a person uh, which I regard as a friend and uh, one of South Africa's most trusted and best investigative journalists. Um, he will tell us tonight all about one of the most influential people of South Africa. And the bonus here is that we have him to answer all our questions and have him just for us for an entire hour. So thank you, Peter Louis, for being here and, and helping us out, making us understand what Ace Machule and this, the, the SG of the ANC is all about. Um, and then before we start properly, thank you to all the Maverick Insiders for having us here um, and making this webinar and all other webinars possible. You guys are very special to us. So, thank you. you. Um, so, Ilias Sokobelo Ace Machashule, and that is the SG of the ANC's full names. He was a student in Siske in the apartheid years. Um, he was charged with high treason in the volatile 80s. He worked as a teacher. He gave his life to the movement. Or well, that is what he would make us believe. Now, Peter Louis, you wrote two books, The Republic of Gupta and later The Gangster State, focusing on ACE in your second book. And you are the perfect person to tell us whether this biography that Ace himself wants us to believe is correct and factually um, factually correct, and, and whether we the picture that he wants us to see is, is the one that we should have. Yeah, Pauli, absolutely. Thanks a lot for having me. And firstly, thanks for those very generous words in your introduction. It's, it's not oftentimes that people speak that kindly about journalists, especially when the likes of Mahashuda is involved. So. Very nice to hear some compliments for a change. Um, no, so Ace Mahashudi has got a very interesting background in the struggle environment, in the struggle movement, and it's certainly one that warrants a very close reading and very careful fact-checking. Um, and I do that uh, quite early on uh, for the very reason you have always viewed it as very important to scrutinize his self-professed sort of struggle credentials, you know, because of the fact that the struggle past in the ANC movement is something that really is a, a credit securing mechanism. You know, that the stronger your str struggle past is um, traditionally, that, that really did ensure political capital in the ANC movement. So in your introduction there, you know, you mentioned the claim that Ace Mahashule was a, a high treason trialist. And that quite interestingly is something that I, that I managed to debunk quite early on. So Mahashule was a student at the Fort Hare University uh, during the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s. And there was a, um, a protest action against uh, Charles Sebes, former Siske government. You know, it was obviously a puppet regime for the, NC, or for the apartheid government. And things got a little bit out of hand. A couple of rocks were thrown and a bunch, a, a group of about 20, 25, uh, um, you know, Fort Hare students were apprehended by the police for civil disobedience and civil unrest, which is quite a sort of a minor infringement. And this very quickly in the sort of hagiography of Ace Mahashule, you know, the, the self-written history of Ace Mahashule became a high treason charge, which he has quite publicly advocated on ANC platforms. You know, I truly believe this um, this bias political capital. And in that chapter, you know, I go on to, to uh, identify other instances where that wasn't the only case where very rich embellishment was used. You paint a illustrious apart of our struggle past. Um, he, for instance, branded himself as a key or central uh, forming member of something like COSAS, for instance, the, you know, that UDF aligned student body. And, you know, people who were on the ground informing those organizations, the likes of uh, Terra Lakota, Dennis Bloom, and sort of other free state struggle stalwarts, they have been open in uh, criticizing Mahashule for lying about claiming that he played such a central role in those organizations. So, you know, certainly it's not somebody who's absent in the broader struggle narrative in, in the ANC environment, but there certainly seems to be quite a lot of um, fabricated instances of his str struggle past and then 
also ample embellishment. Mm, how public disorder turns into high treason, right? That's quite an embellishment. And that makes me want to ask, what are we working with here? Um, mm. Is this not perhaps, Peter Louis, a good old, sometimes perhaps blundering Mutate from the Free State, um, who, especially when you are on the receiving end of the uh, laptops that he gave out to students mm. and people in in the, in the province, you know, when you when you're on that on the receiving end of of being gifted, maybe um, maybe he's the good guy and not necessarily the bad guy that he is being portrayed by as by journalists and and people in the know. Yeah, so that would be my my argument would be that generosity and you know, very publicly handing out gifts and benefits to members of the public has always been a key trait and tactic of gangsters. Um, you know, you can go to, to examples, you know, all the way from, you know, the Cape Flats across the Atlantic uh, to the New York mob and some of the, the gang organizations that operated in Harlem, for instance. They very publicly dish out, you know, food parcels and other benefits to members of the public who keep the public on their side. I would argue that in Ais Mahashile's case, it's nothing different. You know, for years he's been dishing out bursary loans and bursaries to students in the province, the laptops that you mentioned. And then this has always allowed him to, to paint himself as somebody who cares for the uh, community he operates in, you know, for the people around him. And one always have to, you know, you could certainly buy some kudos with that. But you have to juxtapose that against the blatant abuse of public funds that also gets accompanied by these dealings. So on the one hand, you can hand out a 200, 300,000 rand worth, worth of laptops or tablets to a couple of um, you know, needy students. But if you very much involved in you know, the looting of 250 million rand from your, your province's fiscus, kind of have to weigh up the, the real sort of net benefit to society here and wonder if that's not really just a ploy to ensure that you can buy some capital to parts of the community and say that, listen, I'm, I'm pro-poor or, you know, I'm, I'm pro-members of my, my society and I'm actually helping people. So I'm very critical about these uh, generosity and charity drives of somebody like Mahashile. What you describe is perhaps um, using a generosity to garner a certain power and to manipulate people into doing things. Um, and that indeed is a very old political ploy. Now, uh, you wrote this book, um, Gangster State, focusing on a smugshe. Um, but how would you, us as readers, who may not know the first thing about you and may not know that you, uh, the way you work, um, how can we trust you that your book is factual and mm. that uh, and you're not overly critical because your book weren't flattering. Mm. Absolutely not. And I think, you know, it's, it's a, a question that pertains to journalism in general, but I think it's a very good one, especially in the this day and age of, you know, the media coming under fire and media outlets being questioned mm. for the veracity of the articles. I, I would just um, encourage anybody who has, you know, questions about the book, to first and foremost, you know, first of all, go and read the book. Um, because its sourcing is, is quite manifest in the book itself. You know, so I think myself and, and, and definitely in your work is very clear and in the work of some of our colleagues at Amabungani and other organizations, um, you know, a solid fact-based journalism manifests itself as such very easily. You know, it's, it's very easy to see when something looks plausible as opposed to something that's a thumbs up. You know, so when I can report about select dealings, you know, the asbestos deal that we'll talk a bit later on, the reader, the reasonable reader will, you know, see that I've relied on stacks of documentation, which I reference. Um, I quote sources sometimes on the record, other times uh, confidentially because of safety reasons, but nevertheless, you know, it's a series of different sources. So I, I would think the veracity of the facts um, is presented uh, hopefully quite well. And yeah, it, it remains a very important consideration. I think the public, we we do have a um, perhaps a media savviness in the broader society that we we do need to um, work on in in South Africa because there is a lot of questionable reporting out there. But the journalist, yeah, the journalist should always very clearly present his sourcing and you know especially when documented evidence, you know, documents, bank records, 
documents that I obtained from the Free State Provincial Government through PIA applications, for instance. You know, that, that really lies at the core of Gangs Estate and some of my other work. And, and I hope, hopefully, you know, that, that is partly the reason why nobody's been able to successfully legally challenge what, what I've written in the book. Yeah, that is um, is a big plus, obviously, on your side, is that um, that there's an absence of of legal challenges that's successful, um, and and knowing your work, I think a, a good point to make about proper investigative journalism is that if we give your work to any other journalist or any other person, in fact, they would be able to reach the same conclusions, right? Because it's yeah. it's uh, you'll obviously always have bias. And, sure. and so will I obviously always have bias mm. because that's the human nature. But facts don't change and facts can be presented only in, in a certain way. Absolutely. Um, that's why it's very difficult to challenge your facts in court. The themes, now that we have properly laid the ground here, um, the themes I want to chat to you about is um, what are we dealing with when we're talking about a small Um, Is this a mafia type structure or is it more the prime of opportunity? It's like we see a, an opportunity there and we know that the prosecuting authority is not that great. So we see an opportunity there. And before you know these things, snowball. So, so mm. which one of those? Um, I want you to chat to us about a quintessential ace contract where he had his fingers in. And then we need to talk about the revolutionary kids, uh, the children of Ace Magashile, and then by extension also of the ANC that you know, um, uh, and, and which is a big talking point in South Africa at the moment where PPE contracts have been have been given out to, to political mm. connected people. And the last yeah. thing we'll talk about um, obviously be the chess game between President Cyril Ramaphosa and SG of the ANC, Ace Makshule, and where that will leave South Africa. Before we go and, and deep dive into what you have to tell us, we want to thank also the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung for uh, sponsoring our event and our webinar and making all of this possible. Thank you very much. So Peter Louis, Mafia or, um, or properly uh, opportunity, mm. um, a criminal opportunity, what do you think? What have mm. you seen um, in the themes of your investigations? Yeah, Polly, I'm going to have to lean towards mafia, absolutely. Um, and I think that's why I incorpor incorporated the word gangster in the title of my book. And, you know, in the subtitle, you know, I use the phrase state capture or capture. Um, because we, what we're seeing here extends far beyond mere um, random acts of opportunistic, you know, tender crime or tender fraud or nepotism or, or directing a, a, a contract here or there. To a family member, um, I think I believe I've sketched a a case where, for a proper part of a decade, you know, between two thousand and nine and twenty eighteen, there was a structured, uh, well oiled corruption machine at work in the Free State that was headed as a don in a mafia organi organization would uh, by by Ace Mahashili in the province, um, and I really believe that. You know, at the hand of countless examples, I've really illustrated that there's a structure, structured and well-calculated um, gangster-like state capture or gangster or corruption operation at play here, without a reason of a doubt. Um, so, and and once again, you know, as you alluded to early on, I think the the reader, the reasonable reader, would would be able to infer as much. And you now I would venture to say it even beyond the realms of my book, Gangs Estate, as much has been quite clear for a couple of years. You know, there's plenty of, you know, third or, or um, other work from investigative journalists who've, who've came, come to the same conclusion or have actually presented examples of Ace Mahashile the Don directing, physically directing hands-on contracts to flow to certain people in the province. And then there's the accompanying fear and intimidation scare tactics and possibly even violence that is associated mm -hmm. with this um this operation so i, I would certainly lean towards a proper well-structured calculated gangster operation uh tim elliott one of our insiders and webinar lookers want to know if 
Mother Shirley ever threatened you in any way? So he has not directly threatened me in any way, shape or form. Um, I've had a couple of strange interactions with him though. Um, I, I wrote my first Ace Mahashulia story for Rapport newspaper back in the day. I think this should have been around 2013, maybe 2014. Some dodgy sports contract was funneled to a buddy. And it was quite strange because up on that point, it was one of my earliest sort of investigative pieces. And as you would you know, also be able to attest, we normally sort of interact with a spokesperson or a you know, director of communications or whatever. So kind of one day out of the blue, sort of Ace phoned me. And, and I believe that was quite a sort of intimidatory sort of tactic. He was kind of um, not, not directly threatening me, but he was kind of more or less putting me off the story. You know, so a phone call to a young journalist. Now, later, interestingly, when I uh, researched Gangster State and got in contact with a couple of local uh, Free State journalists, the guys from OFM and the Free State Times, the now uh, defunct newspaper, they told me it was quite a quite a normal occurrence to get direct phone calls from Mahashile. Very hands-on uh, sometimes mm -hmm. in terms of his interactions with the media. But then sort of the more direct threats or the implied ones also came from some of the people who were aligned to him or previously aligned to him. You know, I would reach out to people and try and secure interviews and they would say, you know, things like, you know, this is a place where, you know, a journalist can, the free state is a place where journalists can come in and never be seen again and stuff like that. And then the person would laugh and then they kind of in that no man's land between is it a joke or is this a threat kind of thing. So that, that once again, that, that climate of fear it really permeates the free state and it kind of hangs over it uh, like, mm. a, like a big rock, an ominous cloud. Um, we lead right into my next question uh, briefly. Do, why are people scared to death of a Magashile? This is not the first mm. time that I hear that he scares people and that they, uh, they would rather not write about him. Um, a no. journalist telling us that is that they would rather shy away from him. Sure. So firstly, I think the, the threats and the possible re repercussions kind of work on several levels. So people are scared of Ace. Firstly, the less sinister iteration of his scare tactics is that you could lose your job. And that has happened in the province. You know, people who speak out, people who question him. Ace Mahashuli has always been very quick to mobilize and ensure that people who go up against him get either axed out of the ANC as a structure in the province, or if they happen to be in government government positions, either locally or at provincial level, you know, they, they would lose their jobs. So there's a loss of livelihood sort of threat constantly. Then there's the years long suspicion and fears that the free state's political scene has been hampered by physical violence. Um, I write about the, the murder of Nobin Gombani in 2005, who was somebody that very, um, vocally opposed Mahashule's tactics in the province back in 2005 already and was tragically gunned down at his house. Um, days after a confrontation with the Ace Mahashule block in the province. Um, so that, that's all, you know, these kind of, uh, th there's never been any clear links between Mahashule and any murders, but it's once again, it's a, um, a province where, you know, if you speak to people long enough, you know, and, and these are people who are right up to the top. You know, I've spoken to PEC members, uh, people who sat with him on the Provincial Executive Council for years, people who worked in his department and other other departments. You know, there's a province-wide idea and suspicion that, you know, violence does get used to silence people who ask the wrong questions. You know, Louis Siemens, the doctor who got involved in some government dealings, was gunned down as I was wrapping up writing Gangster State. Um, in 2018, I believe. I didn't actually include that chapter. Um, so I think that that's one of the reasons. This aura of violence has almost permeated around him. Now, I, I go back and, and once again, you know, the thuggish sort of gangster, the fact that I could use gangster state in my my title, you know, I think I was more than licensed to do so because Mahashule gets his hands dirty. I write about a, a branch meeting, one of the ANC branches in a small town in the Free State in 2012, 2011, a, a, a big pardon, where we, we might touch on this later, where you know the, the internal violence in the province, the provincial ANC structures. But at the branch meeting, there was a faction who wanted to start generating 
or mobilize for a anti mahashule movement in 2011 already. So they wanted to um, nominate for chairperson for that branch, somebody who was in an anti mahashule block. And a fight broke out, so people wanted to vote for this other guy. And Mahashule allegedly strangled somebody and you know physically got involved in the fighting at that branch meeting. So he later told police um, that he merely kept the warring factions away from each other. So he had to get physical to, to sort of stop them from fighting. But you know, there's more than one witness who testified to him getting involved in a fisticuffs at a branch meeting. So I think that that all sort of you know feeds into this idea that you know it's somebody who you know, if not, you know, by violent means, you know, there's no evidence yet on any sort of hits being ordered by him. But who would definitely, if you dare to oppose him, use anything in his means to, to silence your faction or your grouping and, and, and get, get rid of you and, and politically new to you. So what that is emerging here is someone who used political power to manipulate and to do good. And in order to do good, um, power also means money, it seems. Um, yeah. And when things do not go your way, you also use power to intimidate and to push people out and, and to ensure that you get to where you want to. Now, mm. that takes us right to a very important question. Um, does ACE have presidential ideas? So um, I've, I've always understood th that uh, he definitely did. So I've been speaking, you know, some of his former PEC members, some of his uh, colleagues in the provincial structures, they, they've always told me that he's somebody that um, has, has aspired to the top position um, for, for many years. So we, we haven't seen him make a direct go at it yet. And we have to wonder if the SG position is perhaps a stepping stone in the right direction. We, we also have to remember that um, Ace Makashule's ascendancy in the organization is not only about power, it's about survival too. You know, when, you know, when at, at around the time when the SG position came up, you know, if, if he lost his position as Premier of the Free State, which he would have, um, he needed the position of SG to hold on to political clout and possibly ward off, you know, there was a growing sense that the the war dogs were being unleashed by the you know the likes of the NPA and a supposedly uncaptured you know law enforcement environment. So you know there, there's absolutely you know I've I have it from more than one source that he has expressed political ambitions in terms of reaching the union buildings before um, and it would definitely make sense in terms of political survival. Mm. One one whether that is feasible is another question. Um, I think as, as Stephen Grotes has got him the other day pointed out, you know, it's not somebody who really has managed to build those support bases universally outside the free state. So it might might be a bit of a pipe dream for him. But if you consider how he does still get away with rigging things in his favor, nothing is impossible. We have to keep in mind that the SG position was highly contested and dubious. All indications are that Senzim Kunu won the SG position. And it, it was uh, it was stolen from him. He merely Mukuni merely let that uh, that battle go because he was promised a job in the ANC and then later in, in cabinet. But um, Mukuni outperformed Mahashule for that that position. That's what the tally showed. And then later, after those sort of unresolved or um, untallied votes were were barred, were barred from being counted, Mahashule uh, emerged victorious over Mukuni. So even that was a very fraught process. But somebody who mm -hmm. certainly on all levels gets his hands dirty and he would do that to, to reach the top position for sure. Of course. So um, if mm -hmm. ACEs are questionable um, and perhaps uh, perhaps can we use the word bad um, and borderline criminal or perhaps even criminal, as you say, um, and as your book suggests, why is it then um, that the guy has never been arrested, and he's used that as a as a power tool to say that he has done nothing. He's never been arrested. The public protector is not looking at him. I see some of our insiders rightly say the NPA doesn't seem to to be cornering uh, the don of the free state. Um, mm. That again, one reason not to believe a word that you say. Yeah. So you know, it's it it kind of is a very questionable argument if you're going to go that line 
if you consider Makashuri past. So if you have an active role in essentially locking up or muzzling or disenfranchising the very law enforcement agencies that could have arrested him, you know, then that argument sort of definitely loses the weight. Um, and a, a case in point is the, the whole saga around the Scorpions. Mm. So it's not true that nobody's come close to or wanted to or was on the verge of arresting Mahashule. Shadr Shadrach Sabia's Scorpions in the Free State, uh, we remember as, him as somebody who worked for Herman Mashaba in Joburg, um, but Shadrach Sabia and his Scorpions unit was pretty much on the verge of arresting Mahashule for economic crimes, for fraud, that occurred when Mahashire was an MEC in the Free State, it was an economic development in, in the 2000s. And lo and behold, Mahashire became a very active proponent of the disband the Scorpions movement, and that was let go. So firstly, let's debunk that myth. You know, there's absolutely been very real law enforcement interest in him before. And then after that is a matter of, I mean, that's a story that's been written. Um, in the Jacob Zuma comes to power at Polokwane, the Scorpions get disbanded, and we've got a decade or so of an absolute implosion at bodies like the NPA and a very weak Hawks uh, organization that, of course, would have made it impossible for somebody like Mahashule uh, to, to get investigated properly and, and um, hopefully get prosecuted. Mm. So, you know, I, I don't buy that argument at all. If, if, if you know, the, the organizations were deliberately uh, weakened to ensure that the likes of Mahashire don't get prosecuted, you can't go and use non-prosecution as a reason for, or as an argument for your your um, innocence. Mm. So, we'll, yeah, time will come. But I understand, you know, some of these cases, we might dig into some of the dealings that I unpack involving his daughter, for instance. I do understand that the the law enforcement bodies are looking at some of these dealings. So you know, only time will tell if they, they manage to ensnare the, the big man. You read us or, or you lead us right into my next question, because I want you to tell us about a quintessential is contract. I want you to think about um, uh, something that you investigated, something that you show that is typical of the manner in which you have found uh, that Ace Magashili has done business uh, in the free state. Can you help us? Yeah, with something? Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, definitely, I think it'll speak to the previous question because I think definitely there's a more than a few uh, permutations or events that I believe, and certainly, you know, having spoken to independent law people, also believes deems corruption, which is against the South African, you know, our, our laws. So the asbestos contract, I think some of our viewers might be familiar with that because of the fact that it's playing out at the Zondo Commission at the moment, who has been for, for uh, the last couple of days. That is something that I sort of took an interest in. I was still working at News 24 in around 2016, 2017, I think. And this young guy called Igor Bambani, in fact, yeah, June 2017, he was gunned down in Santon in broad daylight driving a, a 1 million rand Bentley, and he had a 1 million rand cash bundle in his car. So that, that immediate, it kind of like drew my attention, but I never looked at it so closely. I was kind of looking at Ace Mahashire's daughters and their kind of dealings at that time. Kind of like, mm -hmm. and nobody made, you know, there was sort of superficial reporting on that hit, and nobody made any link between Igor Mbambani, the uh, poor deceased businessman, and, and anything remotely involving Ace Mahashire. So it was quite a coincidence when I started digging into him a bit closer. I found that Mbambani, at the time of his death, was involved in a huge deal in the Free State where his consortium or joint venture between one of one of his companies and Blackhead Consulting as a Gauteng based company, they had clinched this insanely expensive and um, you know taxpayers draining contract of 255 million rand to essentially count asbestos roofs in the province. You know, so the long and short of it is I could, I could go out and illustrate how it only cost him about 20 million rand. So, you know, we're looking at pure loot of 200 million rand in mm -hmm. excess. So I dug into that deal 
And when I was uh, writing Gangster State and researching it, I was lucky enough to find this kind of bundle of emails and related information involving Mr. Egon Bambani's business dealings. And then I began to see that, you know, lo and behold, this is Ace Mahashule and his fingerprints are all over this deal. So this contract gets awarded to Mpambani and his partner in December 2014. Then, thanks to the leaked emails, I could prove that in that same month, Mpambani hurriedly gets sort of moved onto a list of business people that travel to Cuba with Mahashule, uh, kind of this um, free state to Cuba delegation for some reason. You know, we've, we have a long-standing infatuation with that country. Um, there they travel together. So that's kind of the start. That's the kernel that I started looking at in terms of their involvement together. And then some of these emails are absolutely, it's actually astounding, you know. So the contract gets paid out in tranches, I think about eight payments in total to make up this more than 200 million rand. And Ace Mahashule, uh, through his uh, PA, Morawari Shalota, is constantly involved in, in these payments. So just by way of example, I think one of the third or fourth payments come through to Mbambani's consortium, this uh, Blackhead Diamond Deal Consortium. So, so like 20 million rand, I think, was the fourth one. It, it lands in the consortium's account, and not, not more than an hour later, you would receive an email from Mahashule's PA, Shalota, saying Premier wants you to pay 400,000 rand year or year. Now, so he's directly, he's on this contract, he's visibly on it. Um, it happens a second time that I write about in Gangster Book A. I think the seventh payment came through in 2016. Um, I think this was 31 million rand, a bit more substantial. Then Ace Mahashule's uh, uh, spokesperson, Tisetsu Makele, he goes and tweets that the ANC in the Free State is coming up in support of Jacob Zuma, was then under fire for all reasons, you know, Gupta reasons and Kandla and, you know, so they tweet about this, they organize this thing um, that's going to be this big pro Zuma rally in the Free State. So a tranche of money lands from the Free State's fiscus to Mbambani's account or that company's account. And on the same day, once again, uh, they get in touch with them. Shalota gets in touch with them and says, can you please pay 200,000 Rand for buses to rally supporters to this pro Zuma thing? And the third example is um, a bunch of pro Mahashule ANC Youth League members, I think about 20 of them, they went to Cuba, it's a second Cuba trip, not the first one, um, in around 2016, I think. And this was once again financed hours after the Free State Department of Human Settlements made a payment for the asbestos deal to Mbambani's consortium. And then Mahashule's people go and beg for the money. Um, so, I mean, you could go and say, oh, I never had any contact with Mbambani directly. But I mean, if your PA says she's doing it on behalf of her boss, um, you know, we, we have to wonder how strong that argument is. So that really is kind of, you know, a quintessential Ace Mahashule deal where <clears throat> you never really see him in writing on some of these deals unless you have a lucky break, like a bit of a leak, like the, the ego file, that's what I refer it to. And, you know, I, I absolutely know that this happened all over the free set with all the contracts. Um, I was lucky enough to find a second sort of unrelated thing, for instance, where it's a, a businessman who got a small, small time businessman compared to these other guys. He got, got about 50 million rand worth of contracts in Mahashire's time as premier, kind of in the engineering, civil engineering sphere. And again, Mahashire's spokesperson, they had the... Um, Provincial General Council, the, the Provincial Elective Conference in Valcom in 2013. And once again, days after this company was paid by the provincial government, uh, Mahashire's PA phoned him and said, Ace wants you to pay 200,000 Rand uh, for, I think it was three or four guest houses to um, an hotel to house people who would vote for Mahashire and his faction at the, at the elective conference. You know, so that is Mahashire's hands-on in his mm. dealing. You know, when, when he makes this argument, and they always do, you know, they, they've got this broad denial where they say that a premier doesn't have a direct influence on procurement decisions. Um, and I've debunked that with hard evidence. 
time and time again, Mahashir is on the scene. And we can talk about his daughter's dealings very briefly, if you don't mind. Um, right. that, that very much also embodies a quintessential Mahashule deal. So he's got this daughter, Toko, and she's uh, a, a young businesswoman. Uh, there's a, a, a shell garage in the eastern free state, in Putarichaba. It's a former Kwakwa homeland. So the, the shell garage operates as an independently owned business. But the, the property is owned by the Free State Development Corporation, the FDC. That is a state-owned body in the, in the Free State. So this guy is happily sort of leasing it. He has been for many years, I think a good 20 years, operating a successful shell garage, paying a, a monthly lease to the FDC. But then in 2014, he summarily gets this notification from the FDC that they're going to cancel his lease. They, they want him off the site there. Of his permit. He was absolutely puzzled. They didn't know what the hell was going on. Uh, then in October 27, uh, 2014, he got some more notifications. Uh, they were threatening legal action. He kind of had to vacate as soon as possible. And then, once again, this is a key sort of moment because we don't frequently see this direct forensic involvement or evidence. I found the CCTV footage from a source uh, for that shell garage. So, okay, keep in mind now the FDC, a state owned body, that is, you know, appointed by the Mahashiri led government. They now, on the one hand, trying to boot off this guy from the shell garage. In December 2014, the broad view of the CCTV cameras, of which the footage I still have, Mahashiri pitches up there in a convoy of about four or five black SUVs, Mercs, blue lights, and shit. Um, he disembarks from the vehicle along with his daughter, Toko Malembe, and FTC guys. Um, Vish Maharaj and Black Isi Yowe, you know, as people on the FTC board. They do a visible site inspection for about an hour and they leave the premises again. So now Ace is on the scene with his daughter. The next year, the FTC goes to court, gets an eviction notice against the guy and boots him off. Then a trust gets set up, the Emma Trust, of which Ace's daughter is the sole beneficiary. The FTC goes and sells this uh, property to this trust, but she doesn't have to put up a cent of her own money. Shell steps in as a third party, pays an upfront lease of about 11 million rand. Uh, 2 million rand of this 11 million rand goes to the FTC immediately to uh, secure the property for her, and she pockets about 8 million rand. And this is Aisma Hashile directly on the scene. Are you saying that Shell may have a hand in, in helping and assisting at least? I've, I've very critically questioned them, Shell SA, about this deal. And I must say their responses have been very disappointing. They maintain that they weren't aware that the Emma Trust was Ace Mahashire's daughter. Mm -hmm. And they said that they pursued the deal to further, you know, female black-owned businesses in the province. And one, one has to really wonder... What, what lay at the bottom of that deal, but, but certainly very questionable corporate conduct from, from a massive corporation in, in South Africa. And once you brought it to their attention, did they do anything about that, Shell now? Yeah, so Shell maintained that they did a proper investigation, a due diligence, and mm -hmm. found no wrongdoing. Um, I was never privy to any of the investigation material. I had to be satisfied with a very broad sort of indication that they found no no wrongdoing. That is quite shocking, right? And it's it's very typical actually of corporates mm. in the world, in the West, and corporates in South Africa that actually aid and abet criminal activity. Um, because telling you uh, that they've done a proper due diligence yet mm. haven't haven't seen any links to to yeah. uh, one of the most powerful politicians in South Africa, yeah. extremely questionable. It, it would have been impossible for them to not find something because the, oh. the FTC's chairperson was Hansi Matseke, who's a friend who grew up with Mahashile and Timahole. And she's in business with Ace Mahashile's daughter. They've got known business ties. You know, they co-directed in entities. So for a you know, corporate like Shell to say that they couldn't manage to find anything that, that, that warrants scrutiny or warrants concern is, is absolutely flabbergasting.
Yeah. Well, the picture that's emerging is is state owned companies being used, but also corporates being manipulated. And one wonders how that's possible if those corporates do not receive something in return. And that is yeah. a theme that we don't only see in, in Ace Magashule's dealings, but also, of course, uh, with other politicians in the country. Tom Uyani at the DBS yeah. Bank, we see that over and over again. But Absolutely. you have quickly um, uh, sort of touched on Toko. But let's jump into the revolutionary kits and let's chat about Tepiso and Tato. Now, I'm sure that you will tell us more about them and, and their current situation. But just a reminder to our viewers that uh, Tepiso was the, the guy, if I remember correctly, that was a consultant with the Gupta family mm -hmm. and was on a three week holiday to New York and, and I think Venice. And Tato um, at one stage accompanied his brother uh, when the Guptas booked them into the Oberoi Hotel. So yeah. there's a history here of, of where the revolutionary kids mm. sort of benefits from, from father and mother's names. And uh, absolutely, now. absolutely, Polly. And it, it kind of goes much deeper than that even. Um, so Tsepisa Mahashule was living presumably rent-free in a Gupta-owned house in Saxonville for a good couple of years. Um, not yeah. only that, we now know that that property was used by Mahashule. So he, he would come to Saxon world uh, to have meetings with Atil Gupta in his uh, son's house that was owned by the Guptas. That's how kind of deep these kind of ties stretch. Tati Mahashule, so that's maybe another kind of modus operandi one, one has to mention, is that it, it, it seems that on the one hand, we've got these individual operator business kids almost, you know, the likes of Koko's daughter, for instance, or um, Ace's daughter, Toko Malembe. But then you also have those that get inserted almost in more established capture structures or networks in the way that Dudu Zani Zuma was placed in the Gupta fold, in the way that Tepisa Mahashule was also placed in the Gupta fold. Tati Mahashule has a very interesting and long standing association with the Vivian Reddy grouping and some of these companies. Wow. And I el elaborate on that in, in one chapter in Gangster State. So it's quite interesting. As I think it's a phenomenon to to maybe look at a little bit deeper in the future. There's almost kind of this dual operation where some of them are led to establish new little businesses that that tap into these rent seeking benefits, and then others are almost placed as kind of business ambassadors of the politician, you know, the PEP in some of these controversial companies and all the businesses of some of these controversial families and business people. It takes, doesn't, Vivian, it takes us right back to uh, another link with the former Jacob Zuma. Uh, Polly, you just broke up there. Would you, would you care to repeat? Uh, the link to Vivian Reddy, doesn't that link right back to former President Jacob Zuma and then, of course, questionable links between the former president and the current SG? Yeah, look, look, absolutely. So Vivian Reddy would be remembered for, you know, company, companies like the Edison Power Group uh, that in the, the height of the, you know, the Zuma, the horrific years of high capture on the Zuma, secured massive contracts from government. So in the Tatu Mahashule sort of context, there was a company that Vivian Reddy's son owned that was getting, you know, significant IT contracts in the free state first to, to build a kind of procurement system for the Free State Treasury. And then this contract was transferred um, using one of those kind of, you know, treasury or procurement loopholes without, without a tender process uh, to the um, Department of Energy to build a nuclear system that was going to be used to sort of administer the procurement side of the controversial nuclear procurement deal. Um, so that's where they kind of come in. And yeah, I, I write how, now, I've, I spoke to, I think it was four individuals who, during that time frame, saw Ace Mahashule openly pitching up at the offices of Vivian Reddy's son in Santon. They would visit him and then they would walk out of there with large, heavy bags. And I would mm -hmm. leave it up to our viewers' imagination to conclude what a bag like that would contain. 
Peter Louis, um, I want to jump into the factional fights of the ANC, but right before we do that, I want to ask you very quickly about, um, um, about the National Prosecuting Authority and why it seems as if they are shying away um, from, from actually going for the jugular here. There's a mm. lot that you're talking about. Our, our viewers want to know um, why it seems to them uh, that there's no movement on, on Ace Magashule from mm. the state. But then I want to also ask you from a corporate banking perspective. Um, it's mm. very easy, like you and I know, that if you have the correct documents uh, to trace and track certain documents or certain certain wrongdoing. Mm. And some all the banks need to do is to call in perpetrators and say, this is enough now and we're closing your bank accounts like they've done with yeah. Gupta's. Absolutely. Well, so I think firstly, the reason why there's maybe not a sort of a myriad prosecutable cases involving Ace Mahashule is the fact that it's somebody who really operated with cash. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I do allude to this in the book quite frequently on many of these deals, cash would be involved. You know, luckily there's a couple of cases where we can find him directing money that was paid through electronic means and that leaves a more discernible trace, of course. But, you know, I've got it, you know, I, I think I've spoken to about 10 people who've witnessed individuals giving Ace Mahashile money. Um, I got Tom Manjoni, who is the um, former mayor of Mangahung, to come on the record in one of my chapters and describe to me in vivid detail how Ace Mahashile took him to the Gupta's house in Saxon World in December 2013, where Atul Gupta gave Mahashile a bag full of money for organizational reasons mm -hmm. it was to help the ANC apparently, and that money was never seen in ANC uh, fiscus again. So that that is problematic essentially. Unfortunately, I think that's a very difficult case to prosecute. Of course, you know, you're going to have to rely on somebody like Tabu Manjoni to testify against. You know, so there would be very little evidence. That doesn't mean there isn't anything to go on. I certainly believe that some of these cases that I lay out in the book um, would, would for certain be good cause for a prosecutable case. Um, as Mahashile directing funds from the fiscus to his personal or political benefit. Remember, it doesn't have to land up in your bank account and buy for you a Lamborghini or a new house to be deemed as corruption. If you are abusing your political position to divert funds from the fiscus for political gain, to sponsor a trip to Cuba um, and, and sort of, you know, take the, the praise for that from your political and the support from your political associates, that's corruption. That is uh, executive members' uh, ethics act contraventions. Um, and not to mention all the other prick things that will come in play when the money laundering and those kind of aspects are sort of um, highlighted. So my I would venture to say that the reason we haven't seen anything yet I can only speculate is that maybe the NPA burnt their fingers to it in, in, in an extent with Estina round one, where they very embarrassingly had to make a U-turn and withdraw those charges to ensure that the, what at that stage was, was a very messy and badly uh, constituted mm -hmm. prosecution to make sure that that homework gets, that goes and gets fixed. And, and I've always wondered whether this has made them wary of anything ACE related or free state related uh, to the extent that they really want to get their ducks in a row absolutely beyond any reason of a doubt before they make such a big move as um, mm -hmm. prosecuting somebody like Mahashire. We, we have to keep in mind that, you know, certainly I think the NPA has made those noises, you know, Shamila Batoy yeah. and uh, Hermione Yoni Kronier and, and, and those individuals have been very vocal about the fact that they are now supposedly independent they prosecute without fear or favor. They don't care what political office someone holds. But we have to keep in mind that the consequences and the stakes here are extremely high. If you go and prosecute Ace Mahashile now, bar Jacob Zuma, uh, that'll be prosecuting, you know, this most senior political person that we've seen getting prosecuted in a good number of years. Hmm. Um, so it's a big move. And they certainly want to make sure that it's a watertight case and, and doesn't, again, uh, cause reputational damage to the MPA by the same kind of mistakes that we saw in Istina round one. Mm, absolutely.
Yeah, briefly, because we only have 10 minutes left, unfortunately. Um, but briefly tell us, uh, speaking of prosecuting and, and, and taking the stand, why is it that investigative journalists do not help the Hawks, the SIU or the prosecuting authorities? Yeah, it's a very good question, Polly. And, and there's always that sort of, not a counter question, but there's also the question about why don't we directly go and lay charges against individuals? You know, that, that sort of traditionally simply isn't the role of investigative journalists. Now, our role is to publicly air and illustrate cases of, you know, with, on the basis of good research, cases of high-level corruption. And once it's in the public domain, um, it's, it's, for it to become an active police investigation, it doesn't require the investigative journalist to go and lay a complaint at the police station. The, our constitution or sort of our law enforcement environment allows for proactive investigations. If a law enforcement body sees something aired th through the media, uh, they, they're not only supposed to, they, or they're not only allowed to, they pretty much sort of a, supposed to at least have a look at the veracity of that. Mm. You know, if there's a, a news report that says, you know, Priscilla Dico has received a slice of a PPE tender, the journalist doesn't have to go and lay a complaint for the SIU or the, the war to spring into action to investigate that. And we've seen that happening now. Um, so it's it's uh, absolutely not the journalist's role. Uh, in fact, there, there should be an arm's length between what we do as journalists and the law enforcement mechanisms that then kick into place after we've exposed these things. And, you know, the, the NPA and the Hawks, as you well know, they've got far more powerful tools and mechanisms that we do. I only, I can, I salivate at the prospect of accessing a bank record um, in the manner that the, the, the Hawks or the NPA can, or tracing emails or phone calls. Now imagine the fantastic compelling links and evidence we can bring up around some of these cases. And they can do that. We can't. And, and certainly that is their mandate and their job. And that, that has to start happening now. Hmm. And uh, another point is that investigators must also investigate the Hawks and the SIU and, and the NPA. So hmm. we can't be seen to assist one faction against another. Yeah. Now, speaking of factions, let's dive right into the ANC war and the chess game between uh, our president and the NC's SG. Now, mm. our colleague Stephen Grutus wrote uh, recently that the history showed how the Secretary General of the ANC can weaken the president. But he also made the point that the president may perhaps be able to weaken the Secretary General. Mm. Um, and today, we have seen a letter that President Ramaphosa wrote to ANC members, which he posted on his Twitter account. And he, on the one hand, he said strong things, you know, it's all things that we know of, but it seems mm. as if he's trying to draw a line in the sand. Whether that will work is obviously another, a, a complete other debate. Mm. He spoke of, of the greatest challenges since the advent of democracy. He said there was a sense of anger and disillusionment um, mm. in the population. He talked about contracts, PPE contracts to individuals associated with the ANC. Yeah. And then he obviously blamed apartheid again, but he also said that the ANC stands now as accused number one. Now, what mm. are the tactical arrows in his quiver relating to uh, the Secretary General Ace Makashile? Because they haven't been mm. on the same side sure. and they continue to try to, to, to pull the ANC mm. in a different direction. Yeah, I think firstly, you know, politically and cloud-wise, there, there's been a couple of, you know, arrows that, Mahash, uh, that that Ramaphosa hasn't been shy to use. And we've seen that when, you know, the, the split is as clear as daylight. You know, we've seen that playing out around pronouncements involving the Reserve Bank, for instance, where we know that the president and the leadership and even conference decisions dictate one thing, and Mahashule uses, abuses, whatever term you want to uh, use, the Latuli House communication mechanisms to signal a completely different message in terms of what the ANC wants to achieve with the Reserve Bank, for instance. There's a couple of such examples. And I think in those little duels, uh, Ramaphosa sometimes very effectively came out as a victor. I think he managed to snub and politically weaken Mahashule on one or two times, one or two occasions. 
But but I would venture to say the, the most effective tool at his disposal is one that is too scared, too weak, too hesitant to use. And that is to invoke decisions around um, acting against ANC members who've been implicated in corruption within the ANC environment. The, the issue of the NPA and the Hawks is a separate issue now. We should re um, remember that we don't want a president who gets involved, even somebody as unpalatable as Mahashule, to, uh, for, Mahash to, for Ramaphosa to go and say, go after this man. That should not happen at all. We need a, a independent, totally detached, um, objective NPA or law enforcement environment. They should just be allowed to go and do their job. Um, but but Ramaphosa does have means within his power in the ANC environment, uh, which he hasn't really uh, seemed to be very keen uh, to insist on. Now, without a reason, we have now, at the, the 2017 NASRA conference, there's a ANC resolution that states people who get in, in, implicated in corruption need to get investigated and need to be, uh, step aside while such investigations occur. And... Ramaphosa is going to get nowhere by addressing these issues in broad terms, by issuing a letter like Pierre's letter and saying broadly, the ANC is opposed to corruption. We broadly are so sad to see what happened to the uh, the ruling party. And this, unless he steps up and uses his power as the president of that organization and pinpointedly um, addresses cases of corruption and starts, uh, you know, voicing his... his um, his concerns over corruption involving senior ANC members, then he's always going to lose that battle. Um, and I think that that is perhaps a bit of a, a lost opportunity. The problem is obviously that he may be accused of meddling um, in, in, in uh, the NPA's domain here and that he mm -hmm. may be um, uh, overstepping as the president. Is that a, a, a an avenue that he should be very careful of? Because um, mm -hmm. ACE Going to take any rebuke lying down. Certainly, yeah. So that that is why you know what I, I emphasize what I just said. So when he steps up and, and and uses those kind of powers, that needs to happen within the ambit or the domain of the ANC. That is, you know, he's allowed as the ANC president, he's the top leader of that organization, to insist that party decisions get enforced. As simple as that. I mean, the the pathways are already laid out. The ANC is allowed. You know, there's an ethics committee. The integrity committee and hell knows what else they, they are very much mandated by the ANC's highest decision making body the national um, conference to act against corruption so that is in the ANC environment but I absolutely agree with you at the same time there shouldn't be a inkling of doubt over whether he's directly becoming involved in directing NPA investigations or Hawks investigations that is an absolute no no. We should never go back to uh, those, you know, that, that kind of environment where his executive authority influences NPA decision making. Hmm. Um, and then, unfortunately, the last question is Do you think that our president is strong enough to win the ANC battle towards the, the good side, towards the lighter side? Um, or do you think that the machinations? around the ANC, around contracts and account and, and, and against power, meaning money. Mm. Well, I suppose, yeah. When? Yeah, I would be, I'm, I'm wary to assume that Mr. Ramaphosa represents the good side of the ANC. I've unfortunately seen enough to lead me to conclude that possibly, you know, all these power struggles are only about power, not really about ethics. Now, in, in 2013, you know, I write about this in Gangster State, Ramaphosa went down to the Free State of a highly fraught and contentious uh, Free State voting process um, where, you know, a, a, a group of disenfranchised ANC members went to court and proved in the Constitutional Court that the Ace Makashule grouping was suppressing their rights to vote in the ANC structures. And Ramaphosa went down there and effectively held Makashule's hand and said that ANC members should refrain from taking the party to court. Mm. Um, so I'm, I've, I've unfortunately been skeptical about his motives. Certainly, I think broadly, you know, he would definitely seems to be in favor of a government structure that is more aligned to one that hopefully we would want. Um, but if, if he is to achieve those kind of reforms, 
you know, the, the kind of action we've seen so far is not nearly sufficient in achieving that. It's a dirty terrain. Um, it's a, a, a very full terrain. It doesn't seem like he, he really wants to take individuals head on in the way that um, it, it would require sometimes. Unfortunately, that is all the time uh, we have at the moment. Um, I have so many questions left and I can see our insiders um, love you and, and really want to ask you more. So I think we'll, we'll make it a date for a later stage again. Um, and meet we'll do a sequel. Yes, definitely. And um, we thank you for giving us your time on this Sunday afternoon um, and for sharing your knowledge and educating us. Thank you very much to the Maverick Insiders and to the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. We appreciate you um, and thank you for making all of this possible. Take care. Thanks, Rodi. Thank you.